The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. Then the Lord say, Seek me now while I could be found. Which means there's coming a time when it will seem like Christianity is this old topic. This this topic nobody really knows about. And even right now, you know, I often wondered, how will that time ever, you know, come? How will the word of God be lost? If everybody truly knows about Christianity, which they do, how could it be lost? Well, if you look at today's world, it's not that the church has left, is that the church is speaking, or, or let's say these earthly places, they're not really speaking the gospel all the time. They're not in conformance to the gospel. It's almost like they have moved away from the gospel and they're starting to speak these uh, more pep rallies, things, philosophies, self-help sessions, motivational sessions, all these different sessions. As a consequence, there are people out there they don't know biblical truths they don't know how to overcome for example many people debate this but emotions for example it's a known fact and there are biblical principles behind getting control of your emotions to actually subdue your emotions so you don't have to tangle with them but if you don't know those biblical principles if you don't know those principles you'll never overcome anger you'll never overcome anxieties and that's a big thing today anxieties uh, there are people who just all of a sudden they're hit with a bunch of anxiety their kids like that who have these anxiety attacks that's what they have and they can't overcome it until you start talking to them i know i engage with the youth uh every single week especially with uh, uh some of these youth with parents who are uh have you know they're Parents were in combat, and the kids are, they suffer from this. They almost suffer from a type of PTSD, right? But it's actually anxiety. And these moments of anxiety hit the child, and they can't calm down, right? They start hyperventilating. They don't know what's happening. Many of them take, uh, what is that, Benadryl to help them calm down, right? Many of them have allergies and other extenuating issues. But the anxiety is is uh you know it's in pretty high numbers with the youth and so when i'm talking to these kids when they give me that feedback they say well they don't know what it is but they feel like their heart speeding up this that and the other and in every single case it's due to the trauma they've been exposed to by their parents who are undergoing some sort of trauma and the child now has a habit of having that shaky foundation and it becomes a it it, it just hampers their growth. But when you talk to them and begin to explain to them what anxiety actually is, and they'll say, what? That, that's all it is. So the next time, right, the, these same kids who once were very disturbed by anxiety, the next time anxiety comes, they're able to see it. They don't rationalize it. They can see it. And they refuse it. And it goes away. Why? Because of biblical principles. Something as simple as that is being lost for the most part. People with anger issues, if they would use biblical principles, they would not suffer with anger issues anymore. They can overcome them. And if you think about something, why does a person get angry in the first place? Just think of one simple principle. And the Bible lays this out beautifully. But it, and it begins in the Bible. But I often ask this one thing, why do people get angry? And isn't it because the outcome, whatever outcome that they're seeing, is not the outcome they want. Think about that. Why is it always that we get angry when something is not the way we think it should be? Just think about that. Think about every time you would ever get angry, no matter what the cause is. You could see somebody getting beat up. It's still the same thing. You don't want that outcome for them. And so you get angry. Does it serve a purpose? No, it does not. It is full on selfishness. And we can't compare that to God's anger. I used to hear people say that. Well, God got angry. And, and the Bible says, be angry and sin not. There's no way we can compare our animalistic emotions to the Father. No way. There's no way we can do it. But a person can overcome it. In fact, they can overcome all things in their lives if they have the biblical principles. 
And it's those principles that are being lost. Simple things. Very simple things are being lost every single day. Forgiveness is one of the number one things in this country I used to see when I was growing up. And of course, we suffered from problems. We had racism and different things were happening in the world, but people forgave. Even uh, in, in my young years, you know, on the tail end of a lot of racism, people were changing. Uh, they were they were really changing in a big way. Why? Because they saw how useless it was. How did they see it as useless? They really saw what happens when it's allowed to fester. And I'm talking about war. And I'm talking about people losing family members. And I'm talking about, you know, the death toll building up in various places. When people go, when countries go to war and children are lost, that seems to be the only time people consider that, hey, we're all human beings. We cannot continue to live like this. It seems like that's the only time when there is no war. It's like a disease that builds and builds and builds and builds. And then war breaks out again. People are humbled again. The same thing happens again. All these little things fester and they build up like they are now. People are so hateful right now. And it's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to pray more and more that uh, people who believe in Christ are not lost in this election cycle. Because can you imagine a person who would mistreat another person because of somebody else's decision? Isn't that nuts? I found something out in life. I want you guys to think of this. No matter who's been in leadership, the Lord still has us responsible for our own domain. It's not really anybody else. There's always opposition, a measure of opposition in our lives. But there's no leadership, you know, in Washington that's coming to your house, disrupting your house in any way. It's, it's just a funny thing. They said prices, taxes are included. Okay. But we have overcome greater things than that, haven't we? And it's almost like folks are losing their civility over people. This is still America. It's still America that hasn't changed but when you have, now you have, we've had this for a long time. We've had such, uh, I'll say, violence in leadership that if people, especially those who believe in Christ, if, if they are totally, I mean, absolutely and totally following the leadership, right? Aspiring to be like the leadership, they're going to have the results of that leadership in their homes. They're going to have that violence. But if a person follows Christ, they should already expect opposition. You know, the Lord told us that the world would be against us. It's not going to be for us, against us. So why would any Christian expect any part of the world to be for them? Think about that. Think about that. Why do people have this expectation that somehow the world is supposed to be this perfect place? The Lord gave you your personal domain. I know a lot of people who are unaffected by leadership and they still have chaos because they have become the source of chaos. How so, you may ask? Because they refuse to have peace. They always complain about something. Something is always wrong. They can never have peace. They, ne they don't want peace because they, have a, they, they become experts at making drama stew, chaos soup. And if we can get away from that by adopting biblical principles yet again, then spiritually, spiritually, we'll overcome everything. I don't know about you guys, but I'll say this. In my own personal home, even I have to be careful. I do, because I'm exposed to information all the time. Right? Believe me when I tell you this, information can give you an overload every single day. If you don't put the information in perspective, if you don't do that, if you don't quickly realize that you're a citizen of the kingdom saved by grace, if you don't reassert your role in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then every day of your life, accept that role in the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you don't do that, sometimes you forget what your walk actually is. You'll start to emulate those of the world. The Lord called us out of the world so that we can make a change in the world. Do you know that? He called you out of the world to make a change in the world. He didn't call you out of the world just so the world could die. No, he called you to make a difference. And that difference cannot be made when you're embedded in the world. He called you out of the world to make a difference in the world. How many of you guys believe in prayer, honestly? There was a time when people used to pray, right? I used to, sometimes I, I would get upset. My dear, I'm confessing this. 
this was some time ago, but still, same outcome. I remember I heard a person ask for help from another, and the guy said, well, I have to pray about it. And that used to anger me. Like, why would you have to pray about helping anybody? So here's what I've found out, though. There's been an element trying to cause people not to even know biblical principles that their lives would be enriched, as the Lord said they would. Because not none of you are supposed to have a life that's full of chaos, falling apart at the seams every single day. No, that's an illusion. That's fantasy. But I've noticed a lot of folks over time who have tried to wash away the principles of Christ and replace that with some of some very profane ideologies. I mean extremely profane, causing people to be in this state of constant chaos. Even those who believe in Christ in constant chaos. In fact, there was a time when it was it was seemed like it was only the body of Christ had become the meanest people on the planet. In the body of Christ. The meanest most judgmental people you could ever meet. I'm sure that some of you ran into those folks and you were wondering, why are they so mad? What are they so mean for? What are they so mean? Right? Why do they have that look on their faces? Why do they only smile on Sunday and their mouth is pruned up the rest of the days of the week? What's really happening? And of course, some of you had a look behind the curtain and you found much of it. A lot of people to be putting on some sort of act some sort of show in front of people because they weren't like that at home some of you guys are preachers kids and not everybody is like you know the pastors that you guys are aware of not everybody's like you know pastor paul and not everybody's like uh, some of these other pastors some of these pastors are something else they really are quite cruel to their families when you notice that it used to make you wonder and you say i'm not going to be like that why are they so evil mean bitter everything's gone wrong they complain all the time and everybody is the devil what's wrong with these people i used to see that a lot then i found it i found out these people were on a constant mission to make people believe how they wanted them to believe and when people did not believe how they wanted them to believe that person felt like they had no control over the people when they had no control over the people it caused them great insecurities because they depended upon those people. Think about that. They depended upon these people for income. And so it was important for them to always reach the people. When it wasn't happening, they would get bitter. Start telling people they were stingy and everything else. I remember those things. Then they would come up with some clever saying and have, you know, five or six offerings. I remember those things. But we, we all remember those things. And we all have to be careful because I don't know about you, but when I saw that, I said, no, not me. Lord, that's not real. What, what, what is that? How can that be a representation of a Christian period? I remember those folks. And to this day, I won't emulate any of them, any of them, because I don't agree with those ways. And it's because they did not operate by biblical principles. They were tied up in something else. They got so tied up that they could not employ biblical principles anymore and they lost control over themselves. They couldn't have dominion over their own flesh and they ended up dealing with it. And that bitterness spread to other people. It did. I know of whole congregations that were affected by things like that. And it really changes and it alters the spirit within the body of Christ in those places. You guys remember that too. And we all have to be careful to remember those things and never emulate them. Because the day we forget, we encounter those folks. It may be the day we begin to repeat what they do. And if we're not careful, we'll become bitter. We'll have complaints, internal complaints. I'm sure I read in the word of God that he wants us in a place where we have no complaints. You know when it says that they murmured and complained in the wilderness. And because of that, they had to wander around for 40 years. 40 years, right? No way. A lot of people say, well, you know, you don't murmur and complain. Don't do that. Well, see, we're not to suppress it. We're not to have it in us. You're to have no complaints in you. No complaints. No backbiting within you. Don't suppress things. We can get those things fixed. We get those things fixed by biblical principles. You don't suppress it. That's like being angry, right? If you're angry, but you're not showing anybody, you're still angry. 
there's no benefit to suppressing it because it's going to come out on somebody or something. You don't have to suppress it. You can get rid of it because if you suppress it, you'll end up like those we encountered in times past. I'm sure nobody wants to be like that, right? But it can creep up on you. How many know that? It can creep up on you before you know it and then you have an outburst. It's because you have to purge it. Get it out of your systems where it's not there so you don't have to suppress anything nor bite your tongue. I certainly do not bite my tongue. I don't bite me. I found that to be no good. No biting the tongue. If you purge things out of yourselves, you never have to bite your tongue. I never have to bite my tongue because if I have something in me where I do end up biting my tongue, I have to take it to the Lord. I have to make a big deal of it. And I do. I make a big deal of it. I have an emergency room emergency. If I have to bite my tongue, because in the Bible it says, out of the mouth flows the issues of the heart or the abundance of the heart out of your mouth. So if I have to bite my tongue, it's in my heart. If it's in my heart, it exists. And I'm not doing what the Lord said to do. He, he told us what to do with those things, right? We're not to suppress the stuff. We are to be freed from it. And when you're truly free, Oh, that's a different story. You know how the Bible says, whom the Lord said free is free indeed. You know how the Bible says, where the liberty, where, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. That means you're not suppressing anything. You're actually free. You're really free. And we're not to fake like we're free. We're not to fake like we're fixed. We can have those things. But like I said, if we're not careful, we'll suppress it. By suppressing it, you keep it. That means you're full of wounds. You're in bondage. You just appear to be free. Well, we know that doesn't work. I believe that's what was wrong with some of these people in time past, in times past. They had suppressed so much and put on that smiling face for everybody. Well, the Lord calls that hypocrisy. If I smile, but there's no smile inwardly, what is our father seeing? Because he can see our facial expressions, but he can also see our hearts. What will he see? He'll see a double-minded man. He'll see a hypocrite. How can we have hate in our hearts towards the same person we're smiling at? Our Father sees all of that, and we don't have to walk around like that. You guys, you don't have to live like that. You don't have to come to a place like this and be as nice as you can and then let it all go when it's over. And then you're back to, you know, whatever you were before. No, you can be consistent. You can be fixed. You can have those things urged. I mean, it would just love to be free from those vices of life like that, not suppressing anything, but being free of them to actually be free. I thought it was uh, almost impossible at one point when I was very young. I knew that the Lord could do it. I just thought it was impossible for me or it was our own big time. I underestimate what the Lord can do and what he does is so simple, but I'll tell you something. The majority of what the Lord does, it costs us so much is he causes us to see ourselves. We are in such denial. If somebody were to say to any person at any given time, you know, you're not as nice as you used to be, they'll be like, well, yes, I am. How dare you say that? Because each person is, is trying so hard to demonstrate who they are. They have forgotten that other people can see who they are without the demonstration. And when that's challenged, we take offense to it. Why? Because we're working very hard to get the world to believe what we're presenting. And there is the key. All the days of our lives, we try to get everybody to see what we are presenting. And it takes work to present something to the world over and over again. Trust me, I know this. I'm not telling you something I read about. I'm telling you something I know. When you present a person to everybody, this character that we make up to ourselves to everybody, that character is going to have flaws because we're not perfect. It takes a lot of work to present a character like that and to maintain it. Which means when you're around people, you present that character. That's where the smile comes from. When you're back home, you're yourself again. The smile leaves. Where is our father seeing that? One day I considered that. And that almost scared the peanuts out of my him and ends. Because it really hit me. The Lord can, he can discern my thoughts. He knows my heart. He knows what I'm doing. He knows this is absolute phonyism. And the truth was, I was afraid to be me. How many found themselves in that position? You were afraid to be you. You're on a path. In the Bible, it speaks to that. 
And Satan is allowed, he's allowed that if a person venture or go against the principles of Christ, Satan has already presented an alternative. See, a lot of people think the world rejects who they are. That's what a lot of people think. And, and here's why. When you were, I'm going to give you an explanation of this so you can see it for yourselves. Because I'm sure that many of you out there, you can't afford to be who you are internally. You're guarding a lot. For a long time, there's, there's been a lot of people guarding who they are inside. They have, like Job did after he lost everything, he was guarding who he was inside until he was reminded something about the living God. And then his guard dropped. The apostles, they were guarding things too. When they were touched by the Holy Ghost, they did not guard anything else. When all of us were young, we were not among saints. We were among others who were of the world. That's how we're born. We're born of the world. Like an embryo in the world, we all were exposed to the same set of rules, the same construct. And we grew up and we found out that this person we are internally, the world does not accept. Others around you did not accept that overly passionate person. Others around you did not accept the person who wanted everybody to be lifted up. You tried to come to the aid of people from time to time when you were tiny and you found out you were going to get laughed at too. And so we became very protective in all those different areas until we came to a conclusion. We said, we can't be ourselves. All of us probably thought that, that we could not afford to show those quote unquote weaknesses. We can't show them. We have to put those away. I'm sure this is a story in the Bible. Somebody knows, some, some of you know this story. But they took that precious person. We took the precious person God made us to be. And we said, we got to hide this person away. And we hid this person away. We hid him away. It's been, for many people, it was tucked away for a long time. And every time it came out, because we would test the waters from time to time, you thought you could trust someone enough to let that person out. And when you let that person out, they betrayed that person again and says, nope, I got to protect this person. That's when we started to emulate people around us. We did what we had to do to hide. Everything to hide who we really were. And we developed a character that fit right into the world. How phony was that? But we did it, and the Lord knew it. And so we get through life, and you start maturing, and you start seeing things, and then you find out something. See, because I'm not the only one that engages with the youth. You guys do too, and what do you tell them? Be yourselves. We tell them that, but we were not that ourselves. Remember that? We tell a child. You know, who you are is beautiful, be yourself. But we didn't do that when we were young. We put on the face of a character we created that we determined would survive in the world. Some people grew into that person they created and they won't be coming back. Some people to this day are hiding behind the character they created. In all cases, that person you tucked away, you won't let them all the way out. It's almost like you anticipate what will happen if that person gets out. Many are still unsure about ever letting that person come forward. Anybody relate to that? In, in, in tucking that person away, we become something else. We didn't have to. We become something else. And But here's the funny part. All of us, we know the Lord's coming. But the Lord is not coming back for the character we created. The Lord is coming back for the person he sent here to this earth. You remember the in the Bible, there's a story of a man who was given two talents. He was given some talents. I'm going to say some talents. And these, he was asking these people, what did you do with the talents I gave you, with the money I gave you in the earth? And, and, and one guy came and said, hey, I went and invested this and so and so. Now I got, you know, tenfold what, I'm, what I had. Okay, well done. Now the guy does something similar, not as much, but something similar. But the one guy says, well, I took what you gave me. And I knew what type man you were, and so I buried it. So that when you would come, when you came back, I could give you back what you gave me. The exact amount you gave me, I'm going to give back. And that was substandard. That was not acceptable. That is not what we're doing here. God doesn't want that little child, that little tiny, teeny person that we tucked away in the beginning. He wants the mature person. That person we tucked away is supposed to be the person to gain experience in the world to grow 
to be nourished. If we tuck that person away and we won't bring that person out until the Lord comes home, we're going to be like that man in that parable who was called wicked. But and if we become that person, right, that we tucked away, become ourselves in the essence, now that we're older, and take all of what comes with it, we will grow. That's how that person grows. That compassionate person that many of us locked away in our youth, that person grows by that rejection it was receiving. We didn't know how to interpret what we were feeling. We were rejected, stomped on. All these things were happening to us. And so we tucked that person away, not even knowing that's how that person grows. That person grows by rejection. That person grows with opposition. And that's who the Father is coming to get. He's not coming to get this character we created. This character we were fine. Nope. He's coming back to get who he sent here. He knows exactly who that person is. He's not coming back to get the strangers we have made unto ourselves. And you know what? In making a new character, think about something. In making a new character for the world, isn't that just as similar to what the fallen did? Isn't it? Didn't they too suffer from the same thing? They suffered from the same thing. It's the exact same thing. Of course, theirs was a little more inexcusable. But we created some hybrid life form in the earth. And we developed that. So this hybrid life form is part of the world. Part something else. We did that. But that person that's been locked away. Just like that story of old in the Bible. With that young brother who was locked away. Locked away. That same young brother was locked away. That same young brother grew by opposition and became great by opposition. And that person who grew, that one that was locked away, who then grew by the opposition, by the imprisonment, that person became the deliverance of all. That's who you are. That person you locked away is what Satan is okay with. Satan loves the fact that you locked that person away, that that person is not being developed. He loves that. You know why? Because he can never overcome that person. Satan can never overcome who the Lord sent here to this earth. But he can overcome the character we create. And when he overcomes the character we create, we sit in depression. We sit in these places of darkness within our lives. And we defend those places by saying, nothing is wrong with me. And we keep that darkness for years. All because we still refuse to bring out that child we locked away so long ago and have that child grow and be nourished and become what it's intended to become. Where do you think this spirit of fear is coming from? If God said he didn't give us the spirit of fear, that's what the Lord said, right? He didn't give us the spirit of fear, so where did it come from? It came from this character we created. We created that character. We don't know how to create like God does. God put a spirit in the person he sent here to this earth. But we have created something else unto ourselves so that we could be comfortable in the earth. And just think about this. We did this so that we could be comfortable in the world. The world is designed that everybody has to put away who God intended them to be. They have to adopt or become something else. They have to present a brand new character. In the education system, that's exactly what they teach you to do. To become a brand new person in the image of the world. That's what they teach you to do. To become a brand new person in the image of the world. And just like an abusive situation, if the world is happy with it, that's the only time you can be happy. And if the world is upset with it, a person will say to themselves, who could fight the whole world? How can I fight what's coming upon me? I can't. That's what we say. Isn't that what we say? In fact, it's like a, we become this mirror of all those Bible stories. And all because the one God sent here, we locked that person away. And we have become something we created. Well, let me tell you something. God never made a mistake. If I lock away what the Lord has put in me, God didn't make a mistake. And sure enough, when that person comes out and those good works, you know, the good, pure works you had within yourself, when everybody else got upset with a person, you did not. You remember that? You did not, but you had to hide that. You had to hide it. 
when somebody else was thinking up some terrible thing to do to somebody else, you did not want to go with those folks, but you went along to fit in. You remember that? That one you locked away said, no, I want nothing to do with that. The person we created for the world said, hey, let's go along with it. Might as well. And have fun with it. Laugh along with everybody else. You see it? Isn't that what happened? And then look at all those areas of your life. Look at the areas of your life where you really messed up in life. Isn't it because of that character we created ourselves? Let me tell you the good news. Huh? Yeah, because some of you are thinking, boy, yeah, that's a bad situation. Here, here's a good part. Not once did your father ever zap your belief of Jesus in your heart. He didn't do that. You still have a belief in Christ. So let me tell you the good news. Even though you created a character to fit into the world, right, so that you could survive, first, the Lord knew you were trying to survive. He did. In other words, it seemed like we had to do it to continue on. It seemed like we had to become this hardened person. Whatever we became, we had to become that person to survive. We were trying to survive. Many of us suppressed our belief of Christ around certain individuals. But the Lord is highly aware of that. And never once did he give you over to a reprobate mind. Because if he were to give you over to a reprobate mind, you're done for. You would also not believe in Christ Jesus. But he did not do that. You still have your belief in Jesus of Nazareth. Isn't that amazing? That means if you still have your belief, you're still in good hands. And the Lord is still very optimistic towards you. Which means your turnaround. When you decide your turnaround, there will be a turnaround. He never zapped your belief. When the Lord still loves you, and there's still placement for you, and he's not willing to lose you, your faith is going to be maintained in Christ. The day a person no longer believes in the sacrifice Jesus made is the day that person is given over to a reprobate mind. So when they don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. You have just seen a person given over to a reprobate mind, and they will begin to believe those things according to how they want to see and comprehend everything. That's what the Bible says. There are a lot of people out there right now, they no longer believe in Christ. They suffered as a child. Life was unfair, but they have become something else. They fought against their own nature and have become something else. They fought against the true spirit, they have become something else. But again, the Lord did not, he did not, not once, did he zap your faith in him. See, God gives you a measure of faith, and that measure of faith is a belief in Christ. If you believe in Christ, you don't do that on your own. That was put in you by the living God so that you would be fully redeemed. No matter what anybody tells you, if you believe in Christ, you honestly believe that he was the last sacrifice. In other words, that he was hung on the cross, that he died on the cross and was raised from the dead. When you believe that, when you believe that he did that for your sins, he became the last sacrifice for all the sins we could ever commit. When you believe that and accept that, that one sacrifice, that's your father's touch that's active in your life because you cannot believe in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ without the touch of God in your life. In the Bible it says, God put that belief in you that you would go to his son. And Jesus said, it is God's will that none of you be lost. Those who believe in him. That's why Jesus said, all who have come to me, the Father has given me, and I will in no wise cast out. And I will raise him up at the last day. Isn't that awesome? God did that. That's why in the Bible it says he's the author and finisher of your faith. In the Bible it says he will finish the work he began in you. So if you're saying right now, well, I just perceive a lot of opposition, don't worry about it because he's going to finish that work. He's calling us to a point of truth. And it's time to respond to that point of truth, which is yes, we created a character to survive in this world, but we don't need it anymore. Because God himself will raise up the very person we put away. It's time for that person to come home. And everybody here at COT, you guys know I've been looking into something. So this equator issue is a very concerning issue to me. We're going to unpack it. It'll take a month. 
30 days to unpack it, but we're going to unpack it. Here's what that means. By the time it's over, you guys will know about the atmospheres, the interaction of the atmosphere with space and the earth, all the little details in between. You'll know about the geomagnetic reversal in detail, university level knowledge. You'll know about that. You'll know about the nucleation of the atmosphere. We really have to go over that. We're undergoing that now. That is a process. It is the reason we're seeing a lot of rain. You'll know about the planet's heating and all the details that go with that. There are lots of details, lots of things we have to go over. You'll know about the masses of the planets, the orbit of the Earth. It's seven orbits. Yes, I said seven. You'll know about those too. You'll know about the axis of the Earth, the standard wobble, and three other wobbles and cycles the Earth goes through. Once you know about these, once you know about the equator's migration, you guys will have a pretty good handle on what's happening. And of course, I'm develop developing a page as we continue to go forward with some numbers that we're going to need to monitor because you guys are going to help me with this. In fact, anybody who can access COT can be a big help in this area to monitor it because this heat that we're going through, right? It has something to do with a type of ice age. You guys have never heard me say that before. So I just said it. It has something to do with the type of ice age and to understand the old ice age versus this linear period i'm going to say that we're going through it is gonna it's gonna be quite eye-opening from there you can see what's happening with the earth in relationship with the rest of the solar system in relationship with something else that's been there all this time the mathematics support it you don't have to budge the numbers at all they they truly do support it mathematics by the way can be plugged into simulations and you can run those simulations a thousand different ways to come up with the exact same result. So you'll be able to track the origination point of something very important. But most importantly, you'll have an understanding as to the weather phenomena that we're soon to see. We're soon to see quite a few anomalies on the Earth. It's important that you guys have a, I want to use the word perfect, but the best I can do, all of what I can give you, right? So you understand this. Somebody says visuals will help. Well, guess what? There's no way you can do this without visuals and charts. Lots of visuals, lots of charts. Uh, not just useless charts either. These will depict the data, the changes, the long-term changes, and the long-term data in association with everything that we're going through now. We'll even go over global warming as the global warmists see it, as it truly is. And then the actual carbon footprint, right? How many, how many, uh, uh, how much carbon parts per million are in the atmosphere right now versus what it used to be? Uh, we're going to have to go over some, some, what they used to use was carbon dating with some of the newer methods. So we can go over the age of the earth, right? Because if you go back to Genesis, there's a surprise in Genesis. Once you see that, nobody will argue the age of the earth again. They'll pretty much leave that alone so, NCOT has four simulations. Now, those simulations are pass-throughs and they're running from a supercomputer. And uh, I'm, we have a portal here at COT where you guys will be able to see this. I, actually, everybody will be able to see it for about two days. Those of you in COT will be able to refer to it a lot. It's important that you guys see this a lot. Because it's a, in, in this simulation is an actual depiction of the actual solar system. And all the data that pours in on a daily basis of the solar system, all the data. When I say all the data, I mean all the data. And now this is now, we're not talking about internet data, not that type data. No, the, this is coming from the, the actual points, the, the data pools of which many charts and things are made up of. So, yes, we did get that set up and we're going to uh, parse that data and present it so that you can see it's important that you see the absolutes of what's happening because this is not going to be some playful thing this is going to be quite harmful it's a very stressful time it'll continue to develop it can give us insights in a prophecy although i never really definitively mix scientific data with prophecies 
to say this is it and the reason why is because all throughout my life when you could say i've accidentally been placed in several positions over my life i mean just the lord had to put me there right i mean who goes who ends up there's no way somebody's just going to end up at white sands right there's no way somebody's going to end up in some special areas all throughout the life that what kind of stuff is nobody does that and then have the liberty and freedom to wiggle out of certain things i'll disclose more of that as time goes on and and uh I need you guys to see something else too. Now I'm only going to show something for about one day. That's it. And I've made it so nobody can capture the screen on their computer. Sad to say, but you'll be able to see it anyway, but nobody can end up in these places. I've learned something. Science is one thing. Science is an attempt, an attempt to understand what God is doing. What God has actually done is beyond all sciences. It is by no means, you know how a lot of people make a mistake. They normally look at everything in this reality. And they say, well, there's got to be a scientific explanation for this, this, that, and the other. The problem is, we don't have the science. We don't have the mathematics. We don't have the physics to comprehend some of the true things the Lord has done. There are miraculous places on the earth, enough miraculous places to where if all these space agencies, if they really wanted to but they can't crack certain barriers they would rather go out to deep space than to attempt to crack certain barriers that are here right here on this earth there are mysteries on this earth that have taken lifetimes and nobody's made progress there are things that are on this earth that are old let me give you an example of this of something real quick something simple to open your eyes now how many people do we have who are trained medical personnel anybody a trained medical individual anybody out there if you are, listen to me closely. This is what the Lord has done. A trained medical person is familiar with the heartbeat of a human or an animal or something like that. They're, they're, you know, they're trained in those areas. They know what to listen for. Did you know, why does a solar system, even within a perfect ratio, have the heartbeat of a human being? Or should I say, why does a human being have the heartbeat of the sun? Then I'll give you that one to chew on. To go look up, you'll see it yourselves. You know where you start? Solar cycles, solar maximums, and solar minimums. Take a close look at those charts. Take a very close look. Take out your calculator, right? Your scientific one. Because you're gonna, you're gonna have to do time constant calculations for those ratios. And you tell me how they can come out so perfect. You tell me. If you know about the human heartbeat, you can't miss this one. That's our father. He did that. So in essence, what I've learned is this. To learn what's on the outside, all you have to do is closely inspect the inside. Once you closely inspect the inside, you have seen the outside. That is not some random selection. That is not some stuff just, you know, forming. That's not what that is. That is by absolute design. And we're talking about on a level that makes no sense. The greater the technology, the smaller the objects we can see, the smaller the forces we can observe. It's the same thing over and over again. In your body is a universe, multiple sets of universes. A universe that works to serve you. If you can understand and, and take evaluate your body once again, you can see how things are working out there. The cells that are in your foot, do they know about the cells in your heart? They're performing something they ride essentially ride a current a cell is doing what it's made to do it may not know the larger part of what it's performing but collectively all these different life forms within your body give you motion autonomy they allow you to think sleep they allow you the head to do quite a bit they do you're giving commands all the time to your body you're performing massive calculations with every step you take. You're actually doing mathematics. That's already been proven on a binary level at a speed no computer can emulate, not even AI. Scientists, they don't like the idea that something can be right in front of them, that they can see inside of it, and yet they still cannot quantify all of it. They don't like that. It's frustrating to have something right in front of you and you can't perfectly emulate it. They've tried. They've tried through cloning. They've tried through 
in a multitude of ways. But still, they're no closer to finding the answers than they were when they started. It seems like what they have found are only things that God allow, allows them to find. You know, there's even an excerpt in some of these books that even the fallen angels did not have the full knowledge. If they had full knowledge, they would not have given all that knowledge to mankind in such a short time. That implies that they were foolish in their actions, doesn't it? And if they were foolish, they didn't have enough wisdom. If they didn't have enough wisdom, they were lacking knowledge. If they were lacking knowledge, they just didn't have it all. That seems to be the standard model for failure. All failure is to go prematurely into something without wisdom not having a foundational knowledge in all things, but to go forward with a few things and an idea that may not be accomplishable. That's a recipe for failure. No matter what they say about, the, you know, just go for it and all this, that didn't work. The Lord teaches us soundness, not to just go for it, not to risk everything, because all the success stories that you hear, you don't hear the horror stories after that success, do you? You don't hear that part. They take a highlight of somebody's life and they say, this person was successful. Please remember that was only a highlight. It is not maintainable. It's not. And time proves all things. Why is it that most of these people, they pass away aimless and almost totally broken and broke. But they had a success. No, they took a risk and it worked out for that one time. And they capitalize on a risk working out. Look at all the people who did not make it. So even statistically, failure is almost imminent for those who walk forward in such a manner, in such a foolish manner. This is what the world advertises, to get people to do this all the time. Why? Because Satan knows if we reach a point of soundness, he has lost his battle of deceiving all those around us. In other words, feeding them their imaginations. Wisdom. When you have wisdom, you don't walk by imagination. You walk by way of a foundation and a solid foundation. Children without being educated, they walk forward with imaginations. When you are mature, you are purposed. Every step you take is purposed. You're very wise in your selections. You're not like a child in that respect. You're only like a child regarding loyal. And the more you know about your father, the more you're going to be like a child regarding loyal and faith. Because the more you know your father, the less you have to know how. He did something. Isn't that something? How do I know that? Because the more I learn, the less I I find out. The more I learn, right? The, I, I find out I didn't know too much in the first place. The more I learn, the more I found out how much I did not know. It's the world we live in. I tend to step out of the patterns of the world, though. I cannot follow the dictates of foolishness. I can't. Just like you, who've accepted Christ and belong to a kingdom that is not of this world. It's a kingdom that's coming. It will not fail to come. And whether people know about the supernatural realm or not, everybody's going to be introduced to it. Man ignores the fact that his heart flawlessly beats until the day he dies, that we can reproduce, and everybody, everybody in the, in the, in the, uh, that DNA field, they do understand how hard it is to replicate someone. But people do that without effort. Those who know about the internal mechanisms of the body they know it's designed you're in a perfectly balanced vessel no matter what it looks like it sustains you and you're a soul or spirit driving it in charge of it locked to it that's why you were born on this earth you had to be born through that process or you would not bind to your own vessel they know that by cloning too even cloning animals it's very difficult to hold on to the spirit of that animal Multiple things step in. Species identification is not absolute with cloning. That's a big problem. Can you imagine that? You make a bird and, and some dog spirit goes into it or some weird thing goes into it. And by the way, anything that's cloned, the creature never turns out to be docile, but devious. Every single one, they know what that is now. That's why these guys started down that path of these esoteric things. Because they understand about the soul. They know there are tons of the spirits roaming this earth that are evil, waiting to jump in a vessel. When they clone something, that's exactly what these things jump into. Now you see how that works. Just as a demon 
uh, demon comes from that uh, Greek word, which means intelligence, just as they desire to possess a vessel. When they clone these animals and other things, they found out something would hop into them. Now, they would act like that animal for a while, but they always exhibit these external disconnected behaviors from the species. And they are quite devious. They're always up to something. And all of them love to fight. Have you ever seen a sheep fight and bite? Be vicious. Have you ever seen a sheep like that? It's against the character of that sheep. Remember Dolly? They showed people Dolly. They tried to demonstrate Dolly. They quickly withdrew that. Dolly became hostile very hostile. They tried that multiple times, the same results. No doubt they tried that with human beings. So they kind of gave up on the cloning idea for the public, and they went to something else. They use it for something else now. What's the big thing now, though? Instead of cloning, what do they want to do? It's one of the purposes for AI. They need an interface. I remember before AI came out, they were working with BCI devices, brain-to-computer interface devices. AI is a manager or an in-between between the computer and you so that you and that AI can become one and the same. You'll see that advertised a lot this year, 2024. You'll see movies that come out and they'll have that theme in them. The AI and humans will make something brand new Then they'll have their interface. And for what purpose would one, would a person want to be like that? Think about that. I wouldn't want to be like that. So what if you can access everything in the world? If you could access everything in the world, you'd finally have answers, but then what? Then what? What after that? I'll tell you what, all your motivations would change. You would get bored again. Has anybody ever gotten poor for a small period of time, everything they wanted? And at first it was wonderful, but then your life became purely dead. It, it just died. There was nothing to hope for, nothing to aspire to. Just imagine yourselves accomplishing all of your goals, all of them, in the earth. That's the ideology. Anybody ever get a, uh, remember the excitement before your first uh, tax refund check? You were excited, right? Don't you remember getting that check, how excited you were? And you felt empowered until you spent all the money. And then it was back to boredom again. And then it happened again, and you were excited. Now, a couple more times after that, you no longer got excited. Why? Because you saw what it truly was. Yes, it was extra money, but you became responsible and you said, well, I'm not going to get excited. This is already accounted for. So I can't get excited about that. Anybody ever get, uh, you get motivated because you're about to get something new? Come on now, you know what I'm talking about. You go out and get that new thing and it feels like it's going to change everything. A couple of hours after you get it, the thrill is gone. And when it's gone, it seems like depression trying to come back in again. Those are tricks and lies. That's the, that's, the, that's the deceit in life itself. To make people believe that somehow getting something new is going to change everything. That's an imposed feeling. How many people have new things still sitting on a shelf somewhere? It's collecting dust. In other words, you get the thing and you never use it. In the excitement, in the hype, and all that that's built up behind it. You've got it. How many people were salesmen? Because if you were ever a salesman, even a corporate exec or something like that, then you understand. Once you can get a person to create a need internally for something, if that person makes a space for whatever you have, they're going to get excited behind it. But it's going to be the same old story after they get it. Once they get their hands on it, it could be the greatest thing in the world. But they find out it does not change the emptiness. It does not alter the voidness. Not so good. Anyway, a lot of that is coming up. I have a good feeling, though, we can circumvent all of that with a little education, a little demonstration. I believe that we can uh, overcome all of that. You'll understand it, overcome it, and we can get on about with our work. Because think of this, there's going to be a lot of people who are not like you guys. They're not going to see the world like you see the world. They're not going to know scripture. Even now, they're learning something different. They're going to be prone and susceptible to changes in the earth of man. They can... Probably, at that time, they'll easily be taken down by the slightest thing. Think about a world set up to depend on something other than mankind. If man depends upon its tools, then that tool becomes its master. We're going to be careful of that. They'd be like you having a walking, talking hammer in your home, right? 
It's a tool, yeah, but it's walking and talking. Well, guess what? If it fixes everything, and everything fixed depends on it, it becomes the king of your domain. You can't live your life without that happening because it knows where everything is, how to do everything, so you become dependent on it. So long as that hammer's around, you can be okay. If the hammer breaks down, you feel like your life is over. You're getting people in the same frame of mind. Same frame of mind. My goodness. Anyway, the more we know about these things, the better off we're going to be, especially about the earth and the mechanisms in the earth. So all you folks that study about heartbeats, you, you medically trained personnel, look into that. That is, that is an astounding fact. It does not stop there. There are so many different facts like that. It's just incredible. But we have to get ready for radiation and a host of other things. I believe the Lord has been warning us. The Lord has been warning people by way of these storms, too. He's showing us something. This is really going to be a thorough walkthrough of all these uh, different facts. But most importantly, I want you guys to see the heat as it migrates. The, the migrational patterns of this heat. It's not the first time. Is that, did you guys know, let me put it this way, do you know that the poles used to be right at the equator? Do you, you guys know about the evidence of Arctic ice where the equator is? Do you know that? Did you know that wherever the equator has been, wherever the rim of the earth has been, it left a specific type of evidence behind? So we've had nine periods where the equator ran right through the USA. Do you know that? And it's about to do it again. These are long durational cyclical events and it just goes with the territory. But the, here's what I'm going to talk to you about tonight. Everybody knows about the geomagnetic reversal, right? I'm sure that you guys, uh, some of you guys were, were listening to Pastor Paul's, uh, what he put together, right? It's good information, what he put together about a geomagnetic reversal. But these excursions, these geomagnetic excursions, right? Is what I want. To, a, a, a geomagnetic excursion is a temporary wobble of the Earth, right? And it causes partial geomagnetic reversals. These are the same uh, geomagnetic ex excursions. Now, as of 2024, it is, this is only theorized, but you're talking about theorized with a high, it is a very high probability of it being factual led to mass extinctions in quite a few places. And here's why. When you get a partial, this, this partial wobble causes the rim of the earth to readjust. And it causes temperatures to readjust fast. Like instead of thousands of years, we're talking about 100 years. Do you guys know we've been tracking weather for 100 years? Do you know that this weather for 100 years of tracking is peaking right now? Do you know that we've gone beyond the point of that one point, um, the actually two degrees Celsius? We've gone beyond the point of no return as of yesterday. Do you guys know that? Remember, they used to tell you that we cannot go beyond the point of no return with the heating of the earth. If that happens, they show tons of documentaries as to what would take place on the earth. We've, we went beyond that yesterday. We're on the uprise of a peak. It is fast. It's opening up fast. So you got to get ready for the rest of it. Hopefully you did not forget all your previous knowledge of that. These older documentaries they used to cover back in 2012. They were true. Most of the data was factual. We're past that point. There is no returning. There's no point where we can reverse what we have started in any reasonable amount of time. So by saying that, I'll say this, the process has begun. It has begun. And uh, it will not be going backwards. And we're going to see the effects of this passing this point fairly quickly. We're going to see this fairly quickly. We've already passed that point. So this, this, this um, geomagnetic excursion is a partial wobble. It happens in a very short time. It is not a full reversal. And, a, a, you know, sometimes they have lasted about a thousand years. But they suspect that this time, because we have, okay, last time this happened. Now, this is through archae um, archaeology, through geology, a study, the magnetic effects, and the temperature effects in the Earth. So here's what happened. The last time this happened, it was a spike in radiocarbon particles. And they know why it was a spike. Now, this is going to get you, and I can't cover any more tonight because we'll go through the details later. Listen to me. There was a spike in radiocarbon particles 
particulates because of the collapse of the magnetic field of the earth. Not a full collapse, but it became chaotic. Miss Timmy, did you hear that? There was a spike in radiocarbon particulates caused by a collapse of the Earth's magnetic field. This was a peak in the graph of data collected. Somebody says, Noah, no, this is well after Noah. So what I'm telling you is this. We have another rise in radiocarbon, don't we? We have a rise in carbon in the Earth. Again, we have a rise. Guess what's happening at the same time? The magnetic field is weakening. It's becoming chaotic. The same process is happening again. This has been mapped over, laid over at least six times. And what I'm telling you is that the data from one period has been laid over the data from another period, has been laid over the data from another period, has been laid over the data from another period, and they all match. It's happening again. So that means the outcome is going to be like the, the other time. Oh my, this is not theory, is what I'm telling you right now. This is not some theory. This is happening right now. That's why you have to understand it. If you don't understand it, your imagination is going to get the best of it. It's going to get the best of everybody. That's why the data is so important. That's why this has to be one of the most responsible things that COT can do with this data. I mean, this has to be absolutely responsible. It has to be full of integrity. With no mistakes. Because it's happening again. I know people are out there saying that well, the largest contributor of carbon is human beings. It's the only thing we can find. I, I know that. But it's not like they can come out with this data and present it to everybody where everybody would understand. But we're going to do that here. It's going to be our responsibility. We're not going to wait for somebody else. To it. We have access to all the data. All the data we could ever need, we have access to every single last bit of it we're going to utilize that access so that we can people need to be educated on this to have an understanding of it. i mean a real understanding that means there are predictable moments that people can prepare for most importantly for example if you guys never knew the heat was coming how could you prepare for temperatures of 125 degrees you couldn't if it caught you by surprise if it caught the animals by surprise, the animals would not survive. Certain crops would not survive. You would have no prep time. You wouldn't be able to survive. You wouldn't know what was happening. You'd be miserable. And it would be, would be for the most part, self-inflicted by, by not knowing. By just simply not knowing. Same principle in the Bible when the Lord said, when our Father said, people die because of a, of a lack of His knowledge. Well, guess what? People also die from a lack of knowledge, period. If you don't know how to feed yourself and you're lost in the woods, you're going to die. You hear me? You're going to die. So I'm going to show you guys in this. We have to go into detail about what these these uh, people who believe in global warming, what they're actually seeing, what they're being presented. We have to go over the data they have versus what's been happening historically. Because it's been happening historically. I'll say it again. There's always been a radiocarbon particulate spike caused by a collapse of the magnetic field of the earth. This has happened multiple times. It's happening again, like clockwork. And forget about the clockwork they present to the public. I, I can't believe they still do that. Where they say, well, you know, this happened between one and five million years. Really? That's a pretty big gap, right? That's a large gap. Somebody says, Mike, be pure upon did a video last night saying Yahweh is the name of it. Well, that's interpretation of language. I never get into an argument over language. Here's why. I found out a long time ago. Language is our vocalization of things to one another, which means we have a lot of errors in our pronunciation and our knowledge of specific words, and we use things wrongly. If that were technicality, we'd be in trouble. I know that the Lord works by the intent of our hearts. We have a language of the soul that does not make a mistake. That's what I know. See, in a dream, when you call out on the name of your Father and your Lord and Savior, you're not talking, but you can still rebuke. You're not using your vocal cords. That's not what you're doing. I also noticed that when rebuking a demon one time, I just routinely said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, and nothing happened. The things were still coming. And the Lord paused me in the middle of a dream. And he said, no, don't do that. And it was like he was, he was not speaking. You know, he told me, he gave me what to say. When he gave me what to say, he gave that, he put that in me. 
and he taught me something that when I'm rebuking something in the name of Jesus, if I do not identify Jesus with Jesus on the cross, I'm simply vocalizing noise and they will ignore it. So he told me to associate that word with Yahshua Mashiach on the cross. So it wasn't in the name. It was in the association of my heart. Demons can be rebuked spiritually with no words. If you have an association in your heart with the Lord Savior Jesus Christ, demons will flee. Do you hear me? When things are vocalized, it's for us to hear each other. The spiritual realm, they'll always hear. They'll always hear. When you put out your intent in a fierce way, or in a true way, they'll always do that. But I, that's why I never get into arguments about language. The English language, you know, I saw a book. I saw a book in the war college, and it led me to another book about the English language. And after I read that, I was sick. Her language is apostate. Just so you know that. Our language is an abomination. If we were to go by the, the, the actual meanings of words, our language, it, our language is disguised. It's something else. Things have been redefined so nobody can see what it is. So I don't get into arguments of that identification of vocalizations. No, the Lord works thoroughly. And you would be sickened if you knew what man did with these languages on the earth to have people speaking incantations of demonic entities. But see, I know for a fact it backfired and it's not working. Because if I say hello to you and I, in my intent, is a greeting, it's going to be a greeting. Only for those who are not covered by the blood, when they speak, they speak an apostate thing. They speak an abomination, a very ancient language. This based on the Arcadian curses. That's what they're speaking. And they jumbled all that stuff together and, 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 and formed that up as a language that was purely adopted by those who were wicked, had wicked intent. And we speak it normally. Let me tell you something. Without Christ, we are doomed. Everything we do, everything we say, what we love to practice is an abomination. And without the blood of the Lamb, we're not going to make it. These harmless things that we do in the world most are an abomination to the Most High. Our language is an abomination to the Most High. Have, has anybody ever thought about the languages? How they actually came up with these things? Because you'll come to the same conclusion every single time. That's why I don't get into arguments about pronunciation and all that useless stuff. You have a language of the soul. There's no error in it. You know in the Bible when it says, at the end, God will return the word to one language, a pure language. So that means the languages are impure right now. So listen to me. As each of us searches for the truth, let the Lord bring us to his truth one by one. Never be divisive about somebody else's findings or what somebody else thinks. I think a lot of things I'm not divisive about, but do you guys see what I'm saying? If I come up one day and I say, you know what, guys, I think this word is means so and so, but then that's my belief. But what you better do is you better follow what the Lord Jesus has placed in front of you. That this is my whole thing. We, we can't follow flesh because all of us stumble until we find our way. So never use anything to cast down your brother. Our pursuit is of the truth, is of Christ. We find things out along the way. We make corrections along the way. I have colleagues and friends, and some of them have very aired views about Christ. But see, I know this. Anybody in relationship with Christ is going to be brought to the knowledge of the truth. Thank you, Lord. Because the Lord said he would do that. Do you see that? The Lord's going to bring us to his truth. We're not going to bring ourselves to the truth. You're not going to bring me to the truth. I'm not going to bring you to the truth. But what we can do is assist each other in our pursuit of that truth. That we can do. See what happens when you pursue that path of truth. Not peace or compromise. If peace is men, no peace, but truth. You have a desire for people to make it. When you have a desire for people to make it, you don't you you stop being an accuser. You also have an ability to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. You do. I'll always choose my fellow man over making a target. You know, Satan had me make enough people real targets. You think I'm gonna freely let that happen again? No, I will not. The Lord chooses whom he chooses. He'll have favor upon whom he has favor. 
Right now in this season, the best practice we can have is not to take the way of Cain, who slew his brother for full acceptance. As each man is given a truth, let that man resolve that truth. Let that person find their way with the Lord Jesus. That their communication with the Lord will be concrete and no one will be able to deceive them. So they will know who they're receiving from. Because in the end, the Lord is the author and finisher of our faith. In the end, he will finish the work he began in us. We don't finish it, he does. That means we're going to stumble. And if it were left up to us, none of us would make it. But it's not left up to us. So long as we believe, he will continue to work on our behalf. He will fully deliver us. Give people their room. It takes room to learn. That's what grace is. Do you know that? It takes room to learn. Remember that. We're in a season now where people are going to nitpick everything they can find to cast down their brother. Please don't be a part of that. There's going to be enough carnage of the world because of this election. Please don't be a part of that. Be a part of your father's solution. A kingdom is coming that is very dark. It's almost to the point where someone can walk through it. Walk through that door and take their seat. Build yourselves up spiritually in the truth that you may be able to withstand the wiles of the enemy, because those days are quickly approaching, and you are that chosen generation that was to take the first step in this new season. Be watchful of the way of Cain, and as much as we're able, you know what the Bible says, as much as you're able, I'm going to paraphrase, get along with your Christian brothers and sisters, as much as you're able, that's a pretty big statement. That means there are going to be times when things are trying, Stand ready to forgive and walk forward. All the people's failure around me has nothing to do with me. You know that? It doesn't. I'm going forward in faith. But most importantly and true, I will not emulate Satan who is the accuser of the brethren. I will not do that. Let each person, as they truly believe, let them walk forward. This is a walk of integrity and honesty. So as you truly believe, you're going to walk anyway. That will reveal who we are. And the Lord will have that revealed. But I'll tell you something. A day will come when the Lord himself will take away whatever's not right in your life. And in that moment, all of us are going to understand that we did not have power to make ourselves clean. We washed our robes white in the blood of the Lamb. Washing your robe is that desire for the true Christ. When you really adopt his words, as far as the other knowledge is concerned, the further away we get from a time, the more confused that time comes. You can see that all throughout the Word of God. We have a New Testament now, so remember that. Remember that so that you can, you can hear things, take note of things, be guided by the Father into the realm of truth. Some things are not knowable right now. They're just not. Some things are unprovable right now because we still have a walk of faith. You guys hear what I'm saying? So in our honesty, as we find these little factual things, right? Suppose it's true. Well, then it's true, right? Suppose a statement somebody makes is, suppose one of those statements I make this wild, strange, turns out to be true. Then so it's true. But what happens if somebody else made a big deal like it wasn't true and they stood in the wrong? They're, they diminish themselves when they do that. But the person who would continue their focus on Christ take note of those things around them but have the father confirm it within them they can still walk forward side by side even with the one that made the comment don't get caught up on names and languages now if somebody pops up and says jesus is not lord okay we got a problem we got a big problem when it comes to how long the toenails of moses are because i'll tell you something nobody can name god nobody has ever used god's name those are titles that's it. There is no name of God in the Bible. Those are titles, provider, banner, all these different titles. Those are titles, titles that people knew him by as he acted in their lives. Those are simply titles. When somebody says, God, that's not his name. That's a title, a designation. Nobody can name God. They would have to have power over God. All these different titles are what men assigned to the living God. Because when they asked God, what do I call you? What did he say? Call me I am. That's still not a name. That's a designation. 
See how that works? He said, I am that I am. There you go. He is. That's not a name. People get caught up in these things and God never gave a name. He gave a designation. In the New Testament, he gave us a name. You know what that name is? Jesus of Nazareth. And do you know in the English language, the pronunciation is not right. Just letting you know that. But Jimmy Craig Corn, we know who we're talking about. If somebody invented a new language, like Squibibish, what if there was a language called Squibibish? And then the name of Matthew was Wakiwaki, and Luke was Ikwik. Now, you know, there's no such thing, but I assure you, there, there's probably some, some language out there that people are speaking just like that. Now, to us, that would be noise. That would be just noise. Part of a language. Don't get caught up on these vocalizations that we make to each other. These are man-made created things. Unless they focused on the real deal here, right? All right. Listen, I want to say God bless everybody. I'm going to see you guys tomorrow right here at COT as we cover uncover some things. Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.